In this episode of Detroit Performs, a bakery serves up delicious Middle Eastern treats. An artist has a unique artistic perspective of multiculturalism and identity. And a graffiti mural spells out a powerful message. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and we have an exciting show for you today. I'm at the Arab American National Museum, the first and only museum in the United States devoted to Arab American history and culture. Today's episode highlights some Arab American artists right here in Metro Detroit. First up is family-owned Shatila Bakery. Take a look. one of the number one things that unites people across the globe. My favorite part about this bakery is to see such a beautiful blend of different people and just see them interact over something as simple as food. Chatila Bakery opened in 1979 here in Dearborn, Michigan. My father immigrated from Lebanon and there was a really small Arab population here so baking and pastry was always something he was interested in and there was a era population growing. So we figured, out, figured why not put those two things together and start a baking business. It was his American dream. He wanted to establish his own business and to build a legacy that his family would continue for generations. The recipes he used were all trial and error. He would literally sleep while his pastries were baking and if, if something he didn't like or if it didn't taste the way he wanted to, he'd throw it away and start all over again from scratch. We're known as a very authentic, homemade bakery. We're a family business from our core, and we want to keep it that way. We want to keep it in the Middle Eastern tradition. So if that's you know people making things by hand using top of the line ingredients, we're going to keep it that way because it's supposed to be a taste of home. It's, it's a taste of a Lebanese kitchen in the US. We offer our signature baklava, which is probably what we're best known for. It's the most gifted, especially around Christmas time and Easter. We do cakes, we do more traditional Arabic sweets. We do chocolate baskets, wedding cakes, anything you could think of, we probably do. Because it's for the customers, they usually, they'll bring us a picture, something to do. And uh, we try to do it, you know, to the best of our ability to make it look the same, really. We actually help each other because sometimes I need to do fun and they need to do that and the cakes have to come together so we're all family here. We do our own homemade in-house ice cream. The ice cream is in the Mediterranean tradition. It's very, very thick. It's super premium and it's made with real pistachios, real almonds and real fruit pieces. And we have cool flavors like pistachio, mango, coconut, rose water, flavors you can't really find anywhere else. Baklava originated around the Mediterranean area of the world. It originated there as a traditional dessert and it evolved over the years to have many several types and varieties which we provide. It's a phyllo dough based pastry traditionally and it's enfolded with layers of nuts, whether it's pistachios, walnuts, cashews, and then it's baked in high volume ovens and drenched in either honey or sugar syrup. We use tough quality ingredients a lot of people tell us that that's what they come for and nobody else offers what we offer. We go to the ends of the earth to find the best pistachios, the best phyllo dough, the best syrups and the top quality ingredients. So that's something that we really stand behind. We watch every ingredient that goes into our food very carefully. We have people sorting through it at least three times because we care 100% about every single ingredient that goes into our baklava. 
If it's the dough, if it's the nuts, if it's the syrup, we want it to be perfect. And um, our product reflects that. I love seeing the expression on a person's face when they first try our baklava. It's, it's the best. We want to give our baklava a certain taste that's in line with the Mediterranean tradition. And that would be keeping it from being too sweet. So instead of you know drenching it in honey, we like to have our customers able to taste the nuts, the, the high quality pistachios, the high quality cashews. We don't want to mask the taste with a lot of sweetness. The true nature of baklava itself is in its nut base. So that's what we want to do. We want to bring out the taste, we want to bring out the crunch of the phyllo dough, and that's what we seek through our recipes. Our employees are experts at what they do. A lot of them have been with us for decades and their work is like a second nature to them. It's something that they've done for years, it's something that they love. When my father first designed this bakery, he wanted it to be as if you were right in the Middle East Mediterranean. You're in an oasis, there's palm trees surrounding you, there's a bunch of delicious pastries right next to you, and everything's in your reach. We're very into spreading the joy of baklava and pastries across the world. We ship worldwide hundreds of thousands of trays a year. We ship everywhere from the US to Barbados to Japan to the UK. During the slow period, we get about 2,000 to 3,000 customers a week. And the number doubles during holidays. The entire place is packed and it's pretty awesome. With the volume that we get, it's very convenient because people come in and out and the cakes move very quickly. We can ensure that everything is top quality, everything is always fresh. In terms of our baklava too, we also make that fresh each day. I like to say that I grew up literally in this bakery and I just feel very proud to be able to you know, lead my dad's legacy and fulfill his dreams and follow my own dreams. Probably my biggest pride is continuing what my dad left for us, just the hard work that he put in this place, and my biggest goal is just to maintain it and make it better. Shatila has been an important part of the community for the 35 years that we've been open. From the first day, my father employed many of the immigrants that first came here, and to this day, they're still loyal workers and a part of the Shatila community and the Dearborn community. So it's important because it has a lot of cultural ties. I believe it brings the U.S. and the Middle East together. There's an American blend of food along with French, European, Middle Eastern. So you can find everything here where a bunch of different cultures, a bunch of different communities combined, people coming together to enjoy delicious food. You can learn more about Shatila Bakery as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Adnan Chirara is an artist who uses both humor and pain in a touching and evocative way. He works out of a sprawling studio, Gallery Camille, a gallery that promotes established and emerging artists of outstanding caliber. Adnan Sharara is a prolific artist and his work spans multiple disciplines. He works in painting, sculpture, jewelry, printmaking, and um, this gallery and studio houses his entire operation. Well, I was uh, born in Lebanon uh, because uh, it happened, uh, I was a summer baby and my mom was there for the summer and then grew up in Sierra Leone till I was six uh, years old and then I moved to Lebanon till I was 13 uh, and I was there in boarding school uh, from uh, six to 13 years old and the war started, the civil war started and we moved back to Sierra Leone and after that I came to the U.S. As an artist, I feel uh, my role is to engage people. I am not here to give them or impose on them a solution. Uh, I mean, like uh, to answer the question is really actually to bring a dialogue because as an artist, I believe uh, you have the role uh, to 
bring a story and open a dialogue. It's not imposing a story or imposing an idea to people. So really, I want them to be engaged, and uh, that's what I feel my role as an artist. The philosophy behind my found objects is, first, these are disregarded tools, so the tools in one way represent the common man, the working class, the hard working class. And then I try to merge it together to talk about certain uh, elements or uh, the you know, certain subject that I want to speak about. Uh, in this piece, as you can see, uh, I translate it into a 3D where it will be uh, done as a large sculpture. Uh, and the indication about the, the different symbolism, why I put the pieces together. First, the pencil, where the pencil symbolizes uh, education, which I believe education is the key factor. A lot of my jewelry that I design and work with are uh, obviously related to the character and the found objects and the drawings I do. Like for instance here, I'll show you, like for instance this is one of the drawings of the character I did and um, then well, we did is translated into a, a, a sculpture, but at the same time, I wanted it to have two functions. It's also, it's a, like a, a necklace. Adnan's vision for Gallery Camille was to be a strong player in the artistic community in Detroit. He really wants the gallery to be available for artists and patrons to experience various forms of art, not just paintings on the wall, but also um, theater and film and poetry and all different types of artistic uh, endeavors. So in the last 10 days, we've had three different exhibitions open in Detroit, and those were all parts of multiple collaborations. Uh, we did a house on East Grand Boulevard where we collaborated with a furniture designer and design firm and brought in Detroit-based furniture and design and Detroit artwork to show how you can exhibit these things together and the wide range of work that's available within the community. We also did a photography exhibition at a local restaurant um, that featured Detroit images in the space, which are now part of the community for the next year. Just the other night, we hosted an exhibition featuring 30 different artists that we show here at the gallery, uh, some of whom we've showed in 2016 and some we'll be showing next year. Truly, I think more collectors should look uh, and take a second look into the artists in Detroit because they are as strong as many uh, other places. Um, and really, because there's always this notion or idea that if you bought it in New York or you bought it in Paris or you bought it somewhere else, it's more like legitimize the piece you're buying. But I don't believe in that. I believe uh, uh, a, a good piece of art is a good piece of art, no matter what it is. What's up, guys? I am here with Dr. Matthew Jaber Stifler, the manager of research and content here at the Arab American National Museum. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, thank you. All right, so tell our viewers out there a little bit of the history of the Arab American National Museum. So the Arab American National Museum opened here in Dearborn, Michigan in May 2005. Uh, so we're kind of a young institution, but uh, from all the projects and programs and exhibits that we do, it makes it seem like we've been here a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And what kind of shows do you guys have here? So we do everything from uh, temporary exhibits that rotate out about every six months, exhibits that we might create or exhibits that come to us from other institutions and other artists. We run an annual film festival. We have a curated uh, run of shows called Global Fridays. 
which is a sister program to the annual Concert of Colors that happens every summer in Midtown Detroit. Yeah, talk about that. You guys sponsor a festival called the Concert of Colors? Yeah, we are the producing partner of Concert of Colors, and it's in its 25th year. Uh, so we took over um, after Access, who founded the program, and uh, we produce it in conjunction with a, a lot of partners in the area, such as uh, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, the Detroit Institute of Arts, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, Access, and the U of M Detroit Center. It's a four-day world music festival, all free, that happens in many venues throughout um, Midtown Detroit. All right, so what's the impact been for the community for this place? So for the museum, you know, we see ourselves as a space for Arab Americans to come to contribute their history and to learn about their history, but we're also a space for anybody in the Detroit metro area and nationally to come and learn about the history, culture, and contributions of Arab Americans. Mm -hmm. And so what's the best part about working in this museum here? I mean, I, our staff is amazing. I have to say working with the staff, we have a, a continually growing staff of young, energetic people and also people that bring uh, tremendous experience to programming and exhibits um, and all of our communications work. Uh, but really the community that we get to interact with, you know, as, as a public facing uh, staff member here in charge of research and content, I get to work with researchers that come in from all over the world. I get to work uh, and give tours to middle school groups that come in on, on an almost daily basis. And then I love when we do our programs, we get to meet such a diverse group of people that come in to see our shows and our films and to visit the exhibits. And how do you choose what programming comes here to the museum? So a lot of it is based on maybe a theme that's happening. If something is happening um, in a home country of, of some of our community, uh, this year our film festival is based on resistance, uh, a theme of resisting all of the uh, pr problems that are happening both on a, a domestic level and on a foreign level with uh, in many Arab countries and other areas of the Middle East. And so we try to theme it in, in ways that's relevant to not only the Arab American community, but to the Metro Detroit region and, and nationally. Okay, and speaking of nationally, this is like one of the only museums that's actually devoted to Arab American history on a national level. So what's that presence like? Yeah, we are the only museum in the country dedicated to telling the story about Arab Americans. We are an affiliate of the Smithsonian Institution out of Washington, D.C., and we are accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. Um, so we take with that uh, the great responsibility of speaking with our community, which is extremely diverse. Arab Americans can come from any of the 22 Arab world countries. Uh, Arab Americans are, are diverse across generations. Uh, for instance, my family came from Lebanon over 100 years ago, but we work with community members that immigrated or came as refugees last week. So we try to cover that diversity and, uh, you know, both nationally and locally. So we're working on behalf of a very broad community. All right, that's great. So what other legacy do you want this museum to be? We want the museum to stand as a, a place for everybody to come and celebrate their own heritage, to learn about the heritage of Arab Americans, and for our own community to come and feel a place um, that's a safe space for them to contribute their history, learn about other aspects of the community that they may not know, and also to be seen as a world-class institution. We have uh, the largest collection by and about Arab Americans anywhere in the country as far as archives and, and books and other published materials. Um, and we put on uh, amazing performances uh, year round. So okay. we definitely want to be seen as a, as a leader in the field. Well, I like that, man. I've enjoyed my time here. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us here at Detroit Performs. Thank you. All right, so let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. The Printing Museum in Houston, Texas is getting a new paint job thanks to graffiti artist Duel. The graffiti commissioned by the museum incorporates Arabic and American typographies in hopes of promoting the museum's latest show. I 
As long as I can remember, I've always been a fan of, of signs, of hand-painted signs. You've been seeing them when I was younger. And then once I got into graffiti, I think that that just opened up my eyes to it even more. I was able to take typography and fonts and enlarge them and use them and bend them and twist them around and create you know, new letters from those original shapes. So it's definitely a big base of my graffiti and street art. The mural that's outside was designed specifically to bring together two different artists from two different backgrounds. Pascal Zogby is the Lebanese artist who is in Beirut and he is primarily a graphic designer and Duel is a local graffiti and mural artist. These two artists together were, were working on this project as a collaboration. We've been going back and forth on email to try to come up with kind of a minimal design that would incorporate American and Arabic typographies. So we both decided on one saying, which is the saying of the show, changing language, changing worlds. And he decided to write it in Arabic, and then I came back on top and kind of weaved it together with the American typographies. Graffiti in general can be traced back to the caves of Lascaux, and it's a, there's a long history and tradition of writing on walls. What's so fascinating about the Middle Eastern tradition is that Arabic graffiti is so heavily based in its calligraphic traditions. Pascal Zogby wrote in a calligraphic style that's based on the Kufic style, and Duel is responding and translating that message into English. I kind of wanted the, the, the wall to have the feeling of it changing and morphing, so I, I decided to, to choose a couple kind of traditional fonts and typographies that we use a lot. So I kind of wanted to stick to the cyan, magenta, and black scheme. And then there'll probably be a little bit of yellow still added in to the end. And uh, Pascal really wanted to go with like more of a real minimal design where we still left a lot of the negative space. So kind of just came up with this design where the letters kind of bounced up and down and kind of gives, gives you a little bit of motion as you look at the wall left and right or vice versa. The way in which writing is um, displayed has a great impact on culture and identities. And there's a historical lineage and precedence about why certain styles and fonts have been used and created or suppressed. I wanted that message somehow to be conveyed since we are the printing museum and we have a very long mission that's about preserving and sharing the knowledge of print communication and art as the greatest contributor to freedom and literacy. Just like a wall that we have that was empty outside can often be a barrier. It can also be a means of opening up communication and breaking down walls. If there's a meaning, it's just the thing that like, even though we're in different parts of the world, like, and there's different letters and different languages, that you can still say the same thing and have the same meaning or express the same feeling. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the Arab American National Museum for sharing with us the rich history of Arab Americans. I urge you to come check it out and find out how important this culture is to our country. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.